Well, a very good morning, everyone. Welcome to our special uh, virtual debate on travel and tourism, the second in our special series looking at these sectors and how the COVID-19 pandemic has hit them across the European Union and globally and the road to recovery, the challenges and opportunities ahead. This particular debate today is called uh, Travel and Tourism, ready for takeoff. And we'll be ex asking exactly that question. Are the industries ready for takeoff right now? Um, I'm joined this morning by a very good uh, panel of guests uh, who are joining me uh, from different parts of Europe. We've got Alessandra Priante, who's the Regional Director for Europe from the World uh, Tourism Organization, UNWTO. Good morning to you, Alessandra. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We also have Miko Tertiainen, I hope I got your name correct there, Vice President of Market Management at Finnair, the airline, and he joins us from Helsinki this morning, close to Helsinki Airport, I believe. Very close. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Nice to see you there. And also we have uh, Belen Gonzalez del Bal Subarat, who's the head of connectivity at the Department of Strategic Marketing Planning in the National Tourist Board of Spain, otherwise known as Tour España. Very good morning to you, Belen. Very good morning. Good morning to all and uh, thanks for having me. No problem at all. Nice to see you there. So thank you to you also, our audience, for joining us on this uh, live debate this morning. If you have any questions for any of our panel, just leave them in the comments box uh, below the video where you're watching this live debate. And I'll put as many of those questions as possible to our panel this morning. We've also had lots of questions in on our social media channels, including Instagram. So I'll be getting around to some of those as well today during this debate. So we're coming together at an interesting time, aren't we, for the travel and tourism sectors in Europe and globally over the past couple of weeks. We've seen some airlines restarting some flights to European uh, destinations, and we've also seen some destinations ramping up their efforts to welcome back tourists. Uh, in terms of EU borders, we've seen some EU borders easing their restrictions within the European Union. And this week, we're hoping and uh, we're expecting that uh, the EU's uh, external borders will be open to some extent. So they've been locked in talks in Brussels over the past few days about opening the external borders. But there's still a few questions over which countries will be allowed to kind of connect with the EU in the future. So there's lots to talk about this morning. So without further ado, let's uh, first of all turn to you, Alessandra, from the UNWTO. I think it's fair to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a massive hit on the travel and tourism sectors in Europe. Unprecedented, really, hey? Um, just give us some of the research and some of the headlines of the figures that you've got about the impact. Well, thanks a lot, Damon. Yeah, you're right. It was really a big hit. And uh, the thing is, nobody was really expecting it because uh, in the beginning, you know, at UNWTO, we have a long tradition of observing, of course, uh, the phenomenon of tourism and the phenomena of travel and tourism connected uh, for a long time. And in the beginning, we all thought it was something very similar to SARS, because in the beginning, everyone was still focused on China. So uh, with SARS, we had forecasted and uh, I mean, we had then evaluated that the impact was soon, uh, let's say, uh, compensated by the fact that nothing was really happening in the rest of the world. This time, when we realized that everything happened in Europe, within Europe, then the problem, you know, really stroke us. And we started realizing, of course, with the travel restrictions being implemented in 90% of the, of the destinations, obviously there's absolutely no tourism. So I'll be, um, I'm very happy to share some of our uh, very, very recent data we just uh, released. Uh, yeah, our okay. analysis, uh, if we can see the first slide, uh, our analysis coming from the uh, barometer, which our uh, TMIC department takes care of, uh, we have basically comparing uh, the first four months uh, of this year with last year, we've seen uh, a global uh, the decrease of 44% uh, in international tourist arrivals. And uh, as you can see, the 44 is actually, you know, exactly embedded in what happened in Europe. Uh, and uh, obviously Asia, 51%, uh, and Africa and the Americas, uh, a minus 36. We're talking April here. Of course, we're all seeing the, uh, the evolution of the pandemic, and the evolution of the pandemic is going to have an impact on this as well. Nevertheless, if we can see the next slide, the way that we've analyzed this uh, phenomenon is actually to uh, uh, elaborate on how the international tourist uh, arrivals uh, uh, evolution was going to take place depending on the restart of tourism. Obviously, we're now confronted with the fact that tomorrow, 1st of July, 
the international borders of Schengen are going to be uh, open, not for every every country, but for the majority, let's say. And so we're looking at the better scenario that we had at the time forecasted three possible impacts based on the fact that we reopened on July, in September, or in December. When we're looking at the best scenario, which means opening tomorrow, we're looking at a forecast of a, of a decrease of 58% in international, global international arrivals. Obviously, not just focused on Europe. Uh, and honestly, this is definitely the best scenario because if we can see the next slide, please, uh, we have done uh, very, let's say, strong numbers uh, evaluation of what the impact is going to be economically and uh, mainly on the occupation side. So we're talking about uh, the potential impact of 850 million to 1.1 billion uh, fewer international arrivals and mainly uh, uh, 100 to 120 million direct tourism jobs at risk, let alone the experts. So we're now looking at the better scenario. So I would like to drop in some hope uh, because we need to as well, Damon, restore some confidence if we want to you know, rebuild travel and tourism. It is really all about that at the moment. And numbers are definitely important because they allow us to understand the phenomenon, but then we need to make the step further. And Alessandra, we'll be talking about the confidence issue a lot, I think, in terms of people wanting to fly, wanting to travel, wanting to go on holiday again. I mean, Alessandra, over the past few months, you must have been sat at home working virtually with your head in your hands thinking, is this really happening? Well, yeah, imagine. I uh, recently joined UNWTO, uh, so lucky. I started my uh, job in November, and so it just took me, I started, then I immediately started traveling because in UNWTO, when we're uh, directing uh, regions, normally we travel a lot. And so literally this began. So I, you know, spoke to my family and I said, look, there's two things here. Either uh, this is definitely karma, that I'm in the United Nations where we really need to help the rest of the world, or I'm very unlucky. So I'd rather go for the first one because I tend to be kind of, kind of a, a positive person. Okay, Alessandra, for now, thanks for that. Uh, Belen, if I can just go over to you in Madrid at the uh, National Tourist Board of Spain. Obviously, there have been a few countries in Europe that have been particularly badly hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Italy, uh, France, the UK, where I am now, but of course, Spain as well. Um, this really has taken its toll on Spain, hasn't it? What's been the impact there to this day on tourism and travel right now? Um, yes, uh, well, Spain is... Um leader, world leader in tourism. Um, uh, tourism is 14% uh, of GDP and of employment as well. And there are other subsectors that benefit from uh, tourism activity. Uh, just think about um, energy supply, water supply, uh, communications, food and beverages, and many others. So uh, yes, it has been a very a uh, very hard uh, blow. Um, you know that Spain is also the first uh, uh, country in the competitive index uh, since 2015 because we have a strong sector, very, very professional industry behind. So uh, we definitely need to go back. There, here there are some numbers, for example, April 2019, it was uh, like uh, 7 million, more than 7 million travelers from abroad coming to Spain. Uh, it was more than 5% 5, uh, 5 higher than uh, year over year. Uh, April 2020, zero. Wow. Zero. So from 7 million to zero. Yes, in the month of April. Now, if we are talking about the four months, uh, it was almost more than 20, uh, 22 million travelers coming. It was more than 4% higher than the four months uh, in 2018. And in terms of uh, traveling expending, uh, April 2019, it was, um, let's see, it was 7 billion euros. Right. Uh, just in April and April 2020, zero. So we really need back to be back uh, on business. Uh, that said, our main concern is the safety. We want to all the travelers to be 
confident, to be comfortable with the idea of traveling, not just to Spain, but to every place, right? Because it's a big industry uh, worldwide. So um, if I may go forward, uh, move forward to our plans, we made a recovery plan that it's like a, uh, with a holistic approach. So uh, we based uh, the plan in four main lines of action. First one is uh, health and safety, because as I have said, it's our main concern. So uh, we have worked in a, a safe tourism certified uh, seal. Um, what does this, that mean? Yeah, this means that we have worked in uh, uh, safety protocols and measures to be uh, put in place by the different uh, uh, players in the industry. So if I was, for example, a tourist coming into Spain, what, what difference would I see and how would I be reinsured by that protocol as you describe it? Uh, yes, well, there are some protocols in the airport. Uh, for example, uh, you have to, to follow some, um, some requirements. And then uh, speaking in the, for example, in accommodations or in the um, uh, restaurants or so, uh, there are uh, some uh, things that they have to, there have been some rebumping in the uh, public spaces. So uh, to allow to have the social distances, uh, they have been installing barriers and up stepping, stepping up sanitization. And uh, they have to follow all the protocols just in case something happens. So we can detect it and uh, do whatever it's needed to do. Uh, okay. So we have made our home, uh, our homework in that uh, matter. So uh, it's important because it's very important for us uh, that the traveler feel uh, that he's safe and also the local citizens. And in this, uh, part of the plan, also the uh, opening borders that you have mentioned before. Uh, we are discussing it in the European Union level. Uh, so we are sure that we are opening borders to from countries to countries that are controlling the, the crisis, the virus uh, crisis. Then the second uh, set of measures is to support our industry. So uh, we can guarantee that they can uh, go through all this uh, crisis, uh, facilitating uh, their uh, cash flow and also um, with uh, protecting employment. And there's a third line, uh, marketing intelligence. So because we need to, uh, to take decisions uh, that are data driven right so we want to uh take the better decision we can with the data we have we have a net of 33 offices all around the world that are in uh, contact with the um, players there with the trade markets they are making uh, this uh marketing research uh, updated on a weekly basis and we are collecting all this information and putting it into a dashboard so we can analyze the data and take the better decisions uh, on when and where uh, do our promotion to be more uh, the most cost effective, right? And then the fourth is the communication and promotion. So we communicate with our industry, with our destinations, so they can uh, take their uh, decisions and their and design their strategies. We also are talking with the uh, tourism trade in the source markets, so we can, um, help them to uh, sell and promote Spain. And then we have uh, a marketing campaign. The first uh, we launched a domestic for the domestic market, and in a few days we were. Uh, we are. We will launch uh, an international marketing campaign. Okay. So, 
Uh, so you have a lot going on in Spain, clearly, and uh, you're preparing uh, for the revival of travel and tourism. And we're going to pick up on a lot of those points that you've just made on there uh, in the next uh, sort of 45 minutes or so, Belen. So I will come back to you. But Miko, I want to bring you in uh, from Finnair. Um, we talked about the sort of impact on tourism destinations and tourism across uh, Europe so far and globally. But clearly, airlines have a lot at stake in all of this. There's been a huge impact on aviation. I drove past uh, an airport the other day in the UK and, uh, you know, the runway resembled a parking lot with all the planes parked up. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I mean, for you, how bad has it been as an airline? Yeah, I would say that, you know, coming off two very good years at Finnair in regards to, you know, profitability and so on, as soon as we hit 2020 and, and we started seeing the first effects of, of, of Corona, uh, the speed that we ramped down our network in, in pretty much February, March, um, we took down our network to a degree where we were flying about 5% of the, of the budgeted capacity for that month. And this continued until pretty much the end of June. And now some of the words that have been you know, said today in regards to hope, in regards to health and safety, in regards to trust and confidence, data for decision making. Um, I'm happy to say that, uh, that as of the 1st of July, we're actually starting our ramp up session so Q2 financially, it was horrible for us. We were making 2 million euros a day loss. And now with Europe starting to open, having some signals that, that, that society is opening up, uh, we are hoping that, that this is the, truly the signals that the ramp up is, 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 is the kind of the, the time to start it up. And we have uh, about 30, 25 to 30% of our originally budgeted capacity, it's going to be in the air in July. So that's the level of our ramp up. And uh, looking at next winter, we're aiming at about 70% of that original amount of flying for the winter season. So in that sense, uh, you know, it's a lot about building trust now and getting the message out in regards to what kind of network we do have. Because, Miko, I heard from a lot of analysts and experts that are saying that, you know, the aviation industry won't be back to any sort of normality to pre-pandemic levels before 2023. This isn't going to change overnight. Um, just if you're watching, if you've got any questions for our panel uh, here this morning during this virtual debate, travel and tourism ready for takeoff, do leave them in the comment section just below the video where you're watching. Very good morning to Kenny uh, Simeon, Phil Allardyce and our Peter Mondell. I'll uh, hopefully be getting to your questions uh, very shortly. Um, Miko, I want to stay from you. Uh, uh, from Finnair, because um, you mentioned the sort of safety aspect, and uh, this really is crucial, I think, to the revival of travel and tourism across the world, because our travellers really want to get on a plane right now. Do they feel safe about doing that? Do they want to go through an airport? Can they be bothered with all these safety checks just to go on holiday? Um, we did a little poll on uh, Euronews' uh, digital platforms over the past few days where we were asking people whether they would feel safe uh, to fly um, on an aeroplane on holiday this summer, given all the sort of safety uh, restrictions and safety measures in place in airports and on board planes. And uh, just over 60% said that they wouldn't be confident to fly 6-0. So, Miko, what do you make of that? And what are you going to do about those kind of confidence levels? I think one thing that we at Finnair have to do, but also as an industry, we do really have to communicate well uh, about the actions and, and the measures that have been taken to make that travel as smooth as possible, uh, be it in the airplane, be it at the airport, or be it at the hotel, if, if, if we're talking about a leisure passenger. So I think, I think um, everyone in the industry has made adjustments. I think a lot has to do with com communicating these uh, adjustments that have been made and by that building the trust and confidence. If we look at our numbers, we do see that as soon as the borders do open, we do see demand come in really quickly that we do see bookings coming in. We do see the, the load factors of our flights increasing quite heavily. Uh, there, also, is demand. Uh, there is demand and we can also see that through surveys that we've been doing to our tier members. And Finner also does own a tour operator who does tour operating for Finnish travelers outside of Finland. And they're starting their package holidays for August, and they've sold, for example, 80% of their of their Greece holidays are already sold. So, so, so there is demand in the market. But Miko, I mean, a lot of governments in the EU still are telling us, well, particularly in the UK, I hear it all the time, avoid public transport. If you have to go on public transport, only do it when it's essential, wear a mask, socially distance, the trains are being kept at a lower capacity. Why on earth would I want to get on a plane surrounded by strangers right now? 
Uh, it's always it's also been said that actually an aircraft is one of the best places to be on it in, in, in that sense that it is that it cannot be compared to other forms of transportation or other areas. A lot has to do with the filtering systems that we have on the aircrafts. And we've also taken other measures that we are also that, that nowadays uh, it is required on Finnair flights to also have the mask. So it's something that our passengers have as well as the the, the, the staff that we have on board. And we've looked at procedures and how we board and deboard the aircrafts to try and keep the social distancing and, 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 and have the contacts at a very minimum. But I do have to say that the filters on board the aircrafts are, are very effective in that sense. And, and uh, the, the statements that, that outside of the industry, people who, who also do look at, at, at the filtering and the air quality say that it is a good system on the aircrafts. And do you think that uh, that will be enough to convince people to come back? I mean, your plan is sort of ramping up. When do you think Finnair will be back to how it used to be? Uh, well, we've said that it, that it, it'll take closer to three years to us to get to any type of 2019 levels. So this is a, a very long term ramp up. And will you survive? We will survive. I'm very confident that we've had a very strong cash position at Finland. I believe the product and the offering that we have in regards to the network and the service that we have, I think it's it's, it's spot on in regards to what the consumer really does want. Um, I think that that, that Finnair, it's a, it, it does have a very good name also if you look at the brand size. So I'm very confident looking at all of the elements, be it the financial or be it how the consumer sees Finnair, I'm very confident that we will survive and we will continue to to hook up Europe with Asia as well as make Lapland and Finland a place for, for those who, who desire Finland and Scandinavia. Okay, Miko from Finnair, thanks very much indeed for now. Alessandra, if I can go back to you at the World Tourism Organization, UNWTO, clearly safety and confidence are the big issues of the day right now in terms of restarting the engines of travel and tourism. I mean, how much fun is it really going to be to go on holiday this summer if you're subjected to all of these rules and restrictions and you're constantly worrying whether the person next to you has got coronavirus? Well, you know, I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, reasoning behind all the safety measures, but I believe that uh, there's also a great need after the lockdown for people to actually go out, to actually, you know, I'm seeing them here in Spain especially, I mean, Belen can confirm this. There is a lot of uh, desire to be out in the terrazas. So I, I feel that everyone is really willing to comply to the rules that are requested just for the pleasure of actually seeing other people, being outside, being, you know, you mentioned before being on a plane. I mean, I was personally on a plane back from Italy just a week ago. And yes, it was completely different. And yes, people are definitely a bit more stressed. Nevertheless, the plane was full which means that we cannot, you know, we cannot stop traveling. We cannot refrain from traveling. To me, actually, Damon, and this is what, uh, where I would like also to challenge my uh, our honorable panelists, fellow panelists today, and yourself as well, and maybe the audience, is when we're rebuilding confidence, we're really talking about, you know, bringing back the trust for the unknown. You mentioned, you know, I might be sitting next to someone who is infected. Reality is tourism is very much, when it comes to feelings, when it comes to emotions, very much about trusting the unknown. Is like many of us, when we pick a place where we go, we want to go where we haven't been before, for example, which means meeting new people, seeing new places. So being sort of exposed to the risk of a new thing. I think this is a major shift because in reality, during coronavirus and the lockdown, we've learned that we should also, we should only trust the people that are around us, sometimes not so much because I've heard stories of husbands coming back with coronavirus, you know, things happening, you don't want to know. But, you know, reality is, is bringing back that type of trust is tourism has that openness, which is very, very uh, cultural and emotional as well. So that is, to me, the biggest challenge. How is Europe working together to try and revive travel and tourism? Because I guess for some countries, it's going to be tougher than for others. So, for example, for the UK, which I was reading uh, in research coming out yesterday, that it's gone down to the bottom of the top 10 uh, book destinations uh, at the moment. And then there are countries, obviously, as well, like Spain and Italy and France that were badly affected by this pandemic. And there are still cases of coronavirus in those countries. Do you think some countries are going to have a harder job ahead than others to convince travellers to come back? I think indeed, but this is mainly because of communication. 
because at the end of the day, it's really about, and this is where at UNWTO, we also support many of our member states in communicating crisis. One of the things we realized, because nobody was expecting this to happen in Europe, is that many countries, I take the example of my original country, which is Italy, just panicked. And sort of the joke was in Italy, the joke was, you know, hey, we're not, let, let's not like overdo in the communication because we might get a false impression that we are actually, you know, they say we are the Wuhan of Europe, which is where everyone else actually capitalized on. I have to tell you something, though, that, you know, it's really difficult to keep the ball straight in those moments. As I said, nobody was expected. Nobody was prepared. Nobody was really aware of how to face such a thing in the region of Europe, especially in the European Union. And the reaction of the European institutions, according to us, has been very strong. Like we've been calling together with them, with the European Commission, my Secretary General, especially in his trip to Brussels, together with Commissioner Breton, we've been calling loudly for coordination. Nevertheless, it's very clear that member states of the European Union in general countries need to keep their sovereignty when it comes to health issues. And it's kind of natural that when you had a similar epidemiological situation, you tend to resume talks. Nevertheless, it's very clear that some of the destinations in Europe especially, and definitely I'm sure Belen can confirm this, cannot do without international tourism. Mm. As well, you know, parts of, 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 of the Mediterranean countries cannot do without the Americans. Many of them are also forecasting a lot of losses because of that. When I spoke to the Barcelona uh, city um, people, they told me that what are they going to do without the, the people coming from the UK? And as well, the Canarias, what are the Canarias going to do without Germany? And thank God, Germany has kept open going to the Canarias. So I think these corridors, as we call them, are, yes, definitely, if we're all coordinated, it's really nice. But definitely, you need to, to, to keep the industry alive. And if that's the main source market, then let's go with it, you know? OK, Alessandra, I'll come back to you shortly. Um, if you're just joining us, watching us uh, for this live debate, if you have any questions for any of our panel here this morning, please do leave them in the uh, comments box. Uh, Ersin and Shaki, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us too. I can see that you're watching us. Um, Belen, if I can just go back to you from the uh, Spanish uh, tourism uh, board. I mean, there really is a balance to strike here, isn't there? Because there are people that want to go on holiday to places like Spain. In fact, they're desperate to go on holiday after being locked up in their houses for so long. But then there are also the critics that will say that you're putting money, tourism, revenues, people's jobs ahead of health. I mean, what do you say to those people? Um... Well, I would say that uh, it's not a short-term approach. We are a very, uh, our, our tourism sector, our tourism economy is very important. And uh, we can't look in the short term. We have to look to the longer term. We have to, um, I would say that uh, if we fail now, we will be out of the market and we don't want that, right? So our main concern now, we, yes, we have to have this balance, but our main concern now is that people feel that it is safe to come back and feel comfortable. Whenever they feel confident enough. So we are ready when the travelers are ready, right? And uh, and what on the discussion about the readiness uh, as well, I think that um, we can't give up traveling because, as Alessandra told, uh, has um, mentioned, uh, we have we all have uh, go through have gone through a very tough time with all this COVID thing. Uh, there are all these statistics, the news. We are like absolutely saturated and um we need to have this break right we need to have a break we need to put all these problems covid problems aside uh, we need to relax and we need to what we say in spain recharge batteries right because when we come back there will be a lot of work to do to raise our lives again and to raise our countries that said we need to travel uh, in a safe way, but also in a comfortable way. 
So I would uh, open here a discussion because uh, we are talking about recovery, but we also have to think farther. We have to do the ex travel experience uh, safe, but also comfortable. So uh, we have to move forward to another um, model of tourism, greener, but sustainable, but also uh, with an ex intensive use of the technology of nowadays. So we have the 5G, we have the, the cloud, we have the internet of things. We can process huge volume of that data in nanoseconds. So we must be able to make the traveler experience seamless, comfortable, easier. When we because go to Ireland, technology is so, uh, really important if you yeah, think about it because going course, through an airport now with all these restrictions you know we've got all the contactless boarding passes and all those sorts of things and even when we're buying things in shops you know we can mm -hmm. scan our phone or just scan a card without actually having to physically put something in somebody's hands so technology is really playing a big part of part of the yeah. safety regime now in the new normal yeah but i think that we must we must move forward a step forward digitization is uh, key for the next uh, model of tourism. Just uh, not only to improve business processes, but also to improve the traveler experience. Just um, actually, we had a, no, we had a question I think that from, we can do better. I think that we can do better. Okay, we just had a question from one of our audience, uh, Eva Zubek, um, who was saying, you know, you were talking about the future face of uh, tourism and the long term future. This uh, Eva is saying, do you think this pandemic will change tourism in Europe forever? you kind of seem to accept that it probably will change tourism forever. Who, me? Yes. Ah, uh, I think, uh, yes, it will change uh, tourism for better, really. But we have to rethink. We have to go to, to, to think. We have to be creative and we have to be innovative. And, and we can think about doing the things as we've done uh, 20 years ago, or as we did 20 years ago, we have to think about another kind of experience and use all this technology, but without losing the essence of tourism, which is the human contact, the human interaction, because, you know, uh, traveling is part of our lives. It's, it, it's part of our own journey. It's part of who we are, and we can't give it up. We can't give up traveling. I'd love um, to throw a, a, a comment yeah. on, on this, that even if we go before Corona, a lot of discussion was, you know, discussed around, you know, mass tourism in general and, and, and how this is to, you know, be looked at. Here in Finland, we've also, you know, it, it's been a niche when you look at kind of, you know, tourism and, and, and very nature oriented. You have some kind of a, these magical, you know, the, the, the northern lights that you can see during the winter time. And how is that consumer behavior going to develop over this kind of period that, where do they want to go? Will they want to go to the mass destinations or will, or will they look for an option that is maybe a bit more focusing on, how would I call it, less densely, more sparse, you know, where, where there's room to roam to a degree that, that I think this is something that we'll start to see, especially considering next summer and how that, how that, how that tourism really picks up in regards to next, next summer. How will the cruise line business, what is that kind of desire of that consumer and I think that consumer is still trying to find the answer themselves. But um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great topic because it goes so deep into consumer behavior, who at the end of the day makes this industry go around. And Miko from Finnair, it's an important point you make there about the sort of change in consumer attitudes, behaviors in the travel and tourism sectors in the future, because surely there's a risk there, isn't there, for an airline like yours on two counts. People may not want to go on holiday so far away in the future. They may be thinking, actually, I've discovered some nice things in my own country. I'm going to stay here uh, for the next few years. And also business travelers, which I know are a big part of your market as well. Um, you know, with the likes of Zoom and Skype and every other video platform you can talk about, people have learned now that actually a remote working does work and people aren't so skeptical about it so you know you are facing an uncertain future in that sense as well no uh, i think someone i think it was alessandra mentioned us going into the unknown and to a degree we are but i do believe that that even during this time i have heard a lot about that that face-to-face -face contact this is where you know where you truly meet the people and and i do believe that 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 we are kind of we're social animals 
And we will want to continue to meet people, be it family, friends, be it in business. This is where you also build the trust in regards to business. Um, but I, but I agree, it will change. The patterns will change. But I don't. But it's not going to disappear. That that I'm pretty confident on. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Miko from Finair, for that. Uh, Alessandra, if we can just go back to you in Madrid at the UN uh, WTO. So we talked about sort of changing consumer behaviour. We talked about this new uh, sort of safety regime, this new normal and the sort of short and long term futures. I guess the problem with something like the COVID-19 pandemic is that it's not really over yet, is it? It's not to, as if we can say, well, there was a crisis and we're through it now and everything's fine and we can get back to how we were. There's still kind of this black cloud hanging over us. I mean, one of our um, viewers has just asked um, before this debate to put this to the panel, when vaccines are approved and distributed worldwide, will this solve the travel industry crisis? Because at the moment, you don't really have a long-term solution, do you? Well, I don't believe that the vaccine is the ultimate solution for various reasons because uh, we're now dealing with the unknown as you said right and i think that uh, all the governments have been trying to adjust to the pandemic and uh, they've all thought they were establishing the best measures possible given that it was probably the first time for for each one of them so i wouldn't consider the vaccine the the as i said the resolution um, let's talk about HIV, for example. Was a vaccine ever found, definitely, that would get rid of uh, uh, HIV? No, it wasn't. So it is really about implementing this possibility into our lives and, this is, and reacting to it. But definitely, you cannot stop the world until you get one of the vaccines. I was just reading yesterday that the Chinese uh, claimed to have found the vaccine. Now, uh, definitely now we cannot say that the vaccine is there because uh, everyone is trying, even in the UK, together with, with other European uh, uh, entities. But now there needs to be the testing. And then there's many questions. How long will the vaccine be for? Is it yearly? Is it forever? You know, there's so many question marks. We cannot focus on that as to be the main response to everything. I want to pick up on what Mika was saying. Because at the end of the day, it's really, you know, we, we, are, we are social people. We are made to be uh, together with other people. We, are, we, are, we were brought into cities and there was this phenomenon called urbanization. It might be that some of us decide to move back out of the city. Mainly I thought this was happening because of costs. Let's say it happens because we just realized that we want to be in the middle of nature. Now, what I think, what we think, especially at UNWTO, is there are other things that we should think about, especially when it comes to policy and to government planning. Sustainability, innovation, data, these are the new normal. They're the new normal because there needs to be a change in the approach. There needs to be a more programmatic approach, even to, let's say, strictly touristically, to destinations programming, because Many of the destinations in the past have been very passive, sort of, you know, counting the number of tourists to say, okay, how many did you get this year? I got this much. And what, and compared to the previous year, are plus X percent. And we were all used to the plus percent. Why? Because people are just traveling more. What really happened in this pandemic, Damon, I think this is the key issue, was control, was the fact that people were traveling, but people, like, the destination knew really how many people were going to arrive? No, they weren't. Therefore, their sanitary uh, and, and health uh, system were completely crushed because of the numbers. So what needs to be done in the future is more programming. That is one of the mantras that we keep on telling our member states and everybody at UNWTO, program, plan, programming. This is why sustainability and innovation are there. Sustainability, not just a nice word that you put because you want to say that your policy is up to date and is fitting the agenda 2030, SDGs, not something funky and colorful that you put next to your conference, but really something that you need to understand, implement, and mostly measure and control. This is what we think is the way forward because Damon as well, we don't want to face the situation whereby, you know, we were talking over tourism yesterday in one destination, and we're going to talk about destroying the environment in another uh, site just because people are not going to be willing to go to the one city and they're all going to basically throw their masks and their plastic gloves in, in, in a beautiful forest next door, you know? 
And sustainability is a central issue. You know, that's been talked about in the industry for, for several years now, and it's clearly taking more of a sort of prominent role. All those things you were talking about, Alessandra, there are sort of rely on sort of joined up thinking across the EU and elsewhere around the world. I mean, some people would say that, for example, in Europe, we've been slow to respond to all of this. And actually, I know you were praising Brussels earlier, but some wouldn't agree with you on that sense, saying that they were slow to respond. I mean, for example, we're expecting the external Schengen borders uh, to open tomorrow to some extent. But actually, I've not seen really any confirmation of that today. And I know member states have been sort of locked up in a room over the weekend still trying to decide. I mean, from your perspective, is there enough joined up thinking going on? I mean, to a traveller or a holiday maker right now, I'd be really confused, actually, about where I could go on holiday or whether I could travel or not. Well... I mean, it's, it's, can I tell you something? It's really, really easy to, you know, sit behind our computers and, you know, and in our house with our family next door and just complaining. As I said before, you know, definitely there could have been a different type of response. I yeah. personally think, and I'm not defending anybody here, I just personally generally think that it was a very difficult situation. And each one of the member states did their best to react upon their own situation obviously when you had very very little debts and you know and the sanitary system was responding well you had a different attitude and you were a bit more proactive when you're completely panicked that all of a sudden you realize that the majority of your population is actually lying in hospital and you're actually telling people not to go to hospital because there's not enough space then it's a different issue so i would say that the response in brussels i think was very con conscious and I have to also uh, give it up to them and also to my secretary general for being so you know, stubborn in advocating the word tourism in the EU. I would like to also call upon Miko and Belen on this. Do you recall the European Commission talking so much about tourism as it did lately? Maybe, yes, it was for the, let's say, for the negative bit. But now, all of a sudden, you had a commissioner who said, oh my God, tourism is the main industry, at least in the European Union. So, Belen, do you think the, the EU has been doing enough? Sorry? Belen, it, and, uh, do you think the EU has been, do, been doing enough, just to come back on Alessandra's point there? Do you feel like you're part of a family that's tackling I, this together? I think that it's a very complex uh, situation. Uncertainty, it's, uh, the context is a lot of very, very uncertain. And I, it gives me, I feel safe. When, when all the um, member states are uh, working so hard. And it's not a problem for me if it's taking uh, some time or more time than we think. I think that's a good thing because uh, then it's, it's the, it means that they are going thoroughly through all the, all the issues and putting all together. So, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, it, it's a good thing that they are log, logged and, and discussing and taking everything into account. It, uh, for me, it, it's, uh, it makes me feel safe and more confident. Okay, but uh, thanks for that. Miko, um, at Finnair, I mean, as an airline, obviously, you know, you've been in the spotlight in the European Union about the kind of support that maybe you should get. I mean, some people are critical of governments bailing out airlines like yours. Um, they say it's not right. Others saying that it should happen because actually you're a central part of connectivity, business and social perspectives in Europe. I mean, do you feel like you're part of a bigger family that's helping to get through this storm? I mean, I would still kind of, you know, touch the topic in, re in, in regards to the, the EU. I think, you know, I agree with Alessandra that the topic is one that's been discussed a lot. And, and, and you hear a lot about tourism in, in Brussels as well as in the, in the, in the, in the individual EU countries. Um, but I, I think one area, if you look at this through the eyes of the consumer and, and, and that future traveler, I think they're the ones who are still finding confusion in regards to can I travel or can I, can I not travel? If it's, you know, what's the basis if I am allowed to travel? And I think this communication is, is, is difficult with, let's say, you know, Finland saying you can now travel to a country in the EU. Um, does that country also allow the Finnish tourists to come? So it has to be both ways. And I think this is where there are still struggles in the, in the, in the marketplaces in regards to kind of we need to clarify that confusion and make it easier for them to, to understand 
to go into Damon's, you know, topic, I think that in this time, you know, Finair, we had a very strong financial situation hitting the corona with, with, with you know, strong finances. Uh, like I mentioned, this has been a tough year. Two, mil two, two million a day losses during Q2. And uh, going forward, we are confident there. We have raised money through the rights. Uh, so, so looking at the shares and the ownership of Finair, we've also taken out loans. So, so kind of gone to the marketplace to see, to, to, to kind of strengthen the, the financials going forward. But um, in that sense, I think, you know, the market environment needs to work. And, 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 uh, and uh, then, then, you know, there are different areas where funding can be found. OK, Miko, I mean, just going back to that point you were making a moment ago about the sort of confusion on the sort of travellers from a traveller's perspective. There is a lot of confusion out there about where you can travel right now, whether you're going to face restrictions on borders, health and safety or what have you. I know that the EU has recognised that and it's actually set up a special website, hasn't it, called Reopen EU. And you can go on there and sort of pick out each different country and find out what the restrictions are. But Miko, this raises another question, I think, about sort of confidence that uh, travellers and passengers have. This big issue, right? Right, of booking tickets and what's going to happen if I book a ticket then I can't travel or I'm away somewhere and then there's a lockdown and I can't get back there's been a whole sort of um, controversy around getting refunds getting money back um, from various different airlines and what are you doing at Finnair to kind of reassure passengers about that because that could be a big block for you couldn't it to getting more passengers flying in the future this goes back to the trust this goes back to the openness and 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 uh, what do you want to give as a, as a customer proposition? I would say that we at Finnair, and I'm very happy and proud to be at Finnair because I can say that we have been transparent and we have been open in regards to our messages to the to the passengers and, and, and to the consumers. In regards to refunds, I would say that we're top of the class if you look at globally who is giving refunds. Uh, we're very open in the sense that the customer can choose themselves that do you want a refund or do you want a, 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 a voucher? If you look in the industry, you can see so you're a lot of offering a voucher, as some have complained about. Yeah, and, and what about know, that? Generally, people have complained they've just been offered a voucher rather than money. And you can see some airlines even pushing towards a voucher option. Uh, at Finner, we're saying, hey, we're doing refunds. We've never had such volume of refunds. So normally, what we refund in one week, it is taking closer to eight weeks for us to refund. But we are giving the money back. We're not making that customer wait eighteen months in some cases to get you know your your refund so i i think that we're doing it well we're doing the same with our whole network that we're pretty much published what we really intend to fly until the end of march 2021 so there is confidence for the traveler when you book finnair this is what finnair is going to fly and don't have to worry about you know you know some some airlines out there still having their whole network out for august and 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 even though i would say that i really doubt they will fly that but i mean it all depends on what approach you know airlines take and and, and in that sense I'm happy that Finnair has taken, you know, that approach where this is this is what we offer. This is how we do it. And, and if we won't fly, you'll be getting your money back. Sorry that it might take a few weeks longer than normal, but we're not going to force you into taking a voucher. OK, because some reassuring words from you. We had lots of questions about that particular issue um, through our social media. So if you did ask one of those questions, I hope that helped you answer it, certainly uh, from Finnair's uh, perspective. Look, we've been looking back on the impact of this pandemic, but let's look forward even more now to the revival and the recovery of these uh, important sectors in the European Union. Belen at the uh, National Tourist Board of Spain, I'd just like to go back to you because... When you're opening up Spain, obviously, you know, you have a very diverse tourism offering. I mean, you have the mainland, obviously, big cities like Madrid and Barcelona, and obviously the islands like the Balearic Islands and the Canary Islands, which are big um, tourism destinations, uh, you know, from countries like the UK and Germany. I mean, we have one question come in from Eva Zubek uh, this morning, who's watching this debate about certain types of the tourism economy. She's saying, how do you think the locals will react to tourists this summer and in the upcoming seasons? Will segments of hospitality like homestays or family-owned bed and breakfasts, do you think that they will welcome tourists? So as you're opening up Spain, do you think people are going to be more confident about going to a big hotel where they can see lots of cleaners, for example? Or do you think they're also going to be keen to go to these smaller bed and breakfasts? And are your local businesses in Spain going to feel confident as well to receive those people? Well, I think that we should go step by step. I don't think we have we will have crowds coming in the next few weeks. So I, I think that we have to be very cautious and be very careful. But of course, um, as I said before, we are we are ready if you are ready. 
Uh, we have taken, put in place all the protocols and all the measures to make uh, everybody feel safer. And, and well, uh, there are, uh, there's a possibility that something happens, but the good news is that we are now uh, able to detect them and, uh, and act, uh, react very um, uh, fast, in a fast way. So uh, I would not have uh, uh, fear to come. We are ready. But of course, if you are ready, if you feel confident enough, I think, yes, we will uh, come back, uh, welcome uh, people come in because, well, it's, it's in our DNA. It's, Spaniards are very, uh, uh, very warm people. And in, but it's a two-way thing, isn't it? We've yeah, mentioned this. Actually, you huh? want tourists to come back, but also the Spanish people have to feel happy about getting those tourists coming back. Yeah, because uh, well, for us it's, it's, it's important both to f that that both the traveler and both the local citizens and the local residents feel safe, right? Okay. So uh, well, we are um, communicating. We are doing our homework. Uh, really, we are doing. The, people have to, to to know that we are doing everything we can to keep people healthy and safe. Of course, there's a, also an individual responsibility, right? So we are yeah. all in this together. You know, it's not just the destinations or the industry responsibility. It's, it's also uh, the responsibility of the travelers, the people coming and the, the local citizens, of course. But we're okay, doing Helen, I just we want to put one more because we're running out of time. I just want to put one more question from our audience to you, Shaki Sumari, um, and this is on the issue of allowing tourists uh, from the UK. Shaki is saying, "Why open the border to the UK? On what basis are those decisions made? Fact or di diplomacy?" Um, I mean, you can look at both sides of this. People coming into the UK, obviously, but I know this week, for example, the UK government is due to announce travel corridors. One of them. Are likely to be Spain because I know that the UK market is the top one for Spain. I mean, do you not worry as a country that Britain still has a high rate of infection? Uh, well, uh, the corridors means that uh, every uh, checkpoint is checked, right? So um, as long as everything, as we do everything fine and and all this corridor scheme is uh, is to to make it safe from the from door to door and back right we have to be responsible so we are not uh opening the 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 the, the borders to the uk market if they can't come right we will open and we will receive them very warmly and very happily as we have done with the Germans uh, to the Balearic Islands uh, two weeks ago. Uh, but uh, as long as we have all settled and all clear and we are very sure that we can guarantee that safety is going to be um, in place all over the, the, the chain, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Um, Alessandra, if we can go back to you at the uh, World Tourism Organization, UNWTO, what do you think now, if you can sum up, if you like, the priorities for reviving travel and tourism in Europe and globally? What do you want to now see happen? Well, basically, a li little bit as what I said before, definitely there needs to be a, a more confident and gradual approach. Uh, we are firm believers, as I said before, on innovation and sustainability. And the reason why it changed the priority uh, now and this answer is because definitely, and we're talking corridors here, we're talking about data, we're talking about also sharing personal data in the ch in the checkpoints and stuff. What we uh, what we think would be very useful, and we're very welcoming, you know, all these uh, solutions that we call them, we call them healing solutions just a while ago with our uh, global competition, to try to definitely introduce uh, an innovative approach in the exchange of this data and the monitoring of this data because it's, it's really important at the end of the day, Damon, that each destination is put in the, into the situation to, to know things, but also to be able to share with the home country. 
the data because it's not, if you're not monitoring the passenger, if you're not monitoring the tourist, then you will definitely lag behind and you will have some emergency cases. I think the readiness of the destination comprises a lot of initiatives. Definitely the, the health uh, system needs to be capable of receiving. There needs to be insurance in place. The uh, Each of every actor, both of the offers and the demand, need to be aware. So the land is right. Definitely the level of awareness has to increase also on the consumer side. And we're all consumers at the end of the day. Me, you, the land, Miko, we all go on holiday. We all did. So the, it, that somehow sort of eases our prospect in terms of the things that we need to implement. But also, let me let me just add that uh, we are now, if, if I may, Damon, we are going tomorrow on the 1st of July on a very symbolic trip to uh, restart tourism in Italy. So we're going to be... You know, we're touching upon two of the probably most affected, uh, definitely, I would take the probably out, most affected uh, uh, countries in the European Union. We're traveling from Madrid to Rome, and we're going on a small tour between Rome, Milan, and Venice. Uh, my Secretary General ha has also uh, been next to the King in Spain for the reopening of tourism uh, just uh, a few days ago. And uh, we are going with the Sicily trip. We're going to experience ourselves, I would say, and also to show the world that when things are done properly, definitely restarting tourism is not going to be such of a complicated thing to do. If we all comply to the same rules and we all do it with a smile and just remember why we're going, because we're, we're, you know, we're going to have an experience. To be able to share that experience, we need to have good memories. So this is what we want to do. We want to send a message to the world that, okay, we can definitely do it. We're not saying the pandemic is over. We're not saying don't respect the rules. Absolutely the opposite. But we just would like to give this positive message. And our Secretary General is very committed into making sure that tourism is really, uh, it, you know, not only restarted, but also embedded in everyone's mind as the positive driving force for this planet. Okay, Alessandra, thank you very much indeed for that. And Miko, let's just go back to you at Finair. How are you looking at the coming months and coming years? I mean, are we going to see the aviation industry change forever? And as passengers, are we going to have to pay more in the future? Uh, great questions, and I wish I had the answers to these unknowns. Um, I think we'll see, but like I mentioned, I th we're, we're confident. Uh, I think, you know, the main goals for us is, is, is to get rid of the confusion, build the trust, and, and have borders opening in a responsible fashion. And I think then the, the market is open. Let those who can who can who can survive, let them survive and, and, and you know let competition let competition you know be there. So so I take that kind of you know view on the on, on, on going forward. But in the you know in the sense of Finland, Finnair, uh, I think we have a you know a, a great offering and, and, and I'm sure this offering will also be there in the future. OK, Miko from Finnair, thanks for that. We've just got a few minutes left. And of course, I actually set all of my guests some homework before this debate. Some of you I know were stressing out about it a little bit, but it's a little bit of fun. I asked all of the guests today on our virtual debate, Travel and Tourism Ready for Takeoff, brought to you by Euronews, to bring an item which really to them symbolises travel and tourism and the importance of its sort of revival and recovery. Uh, Miko, so what have you brought with you? Let, let's reveal it on camera. I've lived oh. 14... I've lived 14 years in New York. I think it's it's my favorite city in the world. And uh, I have to say that living there for 14 years, it did teach me one thing that also blue eyes, so Frank Sinatra things. If you can succeed there, you can succeed anywhere. And that's the attitude that the travel industry needs right now is that we can get through this, we can survive. So a little bit of New York into everyone. Thanks. Okay, let's not hear your rendition of uh, Frank Sinatra for now. I think that'll probably be for another uh, live uh, session. Uh, Alessandra from the UNWTA, what have you brought with you? Well, you know, after make a, make a statement, it's really difficult to, to keep up. But I think I'm going to be sharing something very dear to me, which is, oh. this is a DVD Blu-ray. I just got it, actually from America. It's uh, the new Depeche Mode Spirits in the Forest, a double Blu-ray on their concerts. So wow. I no started traveling around Europe when I was a very little girl. I was actually 14. Uh, when uh, following my uh, group, uh, I would say my religion, which is the fresh mode. So, you know, definitely I am. This is what really represents me traveling around the world with a lot of heart there. Fantastic. Depeche Mode has taken Alessandra right around the world. Great. And Belen, last but not least, what, what are you going to show us from Madrid there? 
Well, this is the photo album I know right. you of my daughter. Now here we have a lot of pictures about the beach, about the, well, it's uh, Iguazu and Uruguay and uh, our summer place in the north and also Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is the beach in Chile. So uh, this is for me to say that traveling is part of our life, is part of our memories, is part of who we are. And again, we cannot give up traveling. We have to, okay. uh, to travel again, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Belen. On that uh, note, Belen Gonzalez del Bal Subarats, who's the head of connectivity at the National Tourist Board of Spain. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Also, we had uh, Miko Tertiainen, vice president of market management at Finair in Helsinki. And also we had Alessandra Briante, the regional director from Europe for the uh, World Tourism Organization, the UNWTO. Thank you very much indeed for all of you for joining us. It was fascinating uh, to see your personal objects there that represent uh, travel and tourism. And thanks to all of you that have been watching our audience this uh, virtual debate today travel and tourism ready for takeoff sorry we couldn't get around to all of your questions but very much thank you for sending them in and hopefully uh, we got around to some of the key uh, topics this was the latest virtual debate in our special series uh, from Euronews on travel and tourism in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic we've got a couple more coming up over the next month or so one focused on Asia another one on Africa so look out on our social media platforms uh, for details of those but for now, thank you very much indeed for watching. And if you are going on holiday, happy holidays. Bye for now.